Good. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm Carrie Coogan. I'm Deputy Director of the Kansas City Public Library. Thanks for being here. I want to make sure for everyone who does not know, if you would like a calendar of our events both here and at the plaza, you can sign up using um, the information in this calendar. I'm looking at you right there because <laughs> I heard you talking to Whitney about it, so you need to sign up. And you can also get an email blast if you want to. Okay, so um, make sure you sign up and tell your friends to come. Many of you know or are familiar with nationally known and hometown novelist Whitney Terrell. He's the author of three books, The Huntsman, The King of Kings County, and The Good Lieutenant. I've also heard that there's a new and fourth novel in the works as we speak. Whitney is also a professor at UMKC's MFA in Creative Writing, and he co-hosts a bi-weekly podcast on LitHub called Fiction Nonfiction. But some of Whitney's greatest work through his long time and enduring partnership, has been here at the library. More than 10 years ago, Whitney began a series called Writers at Work, right here at this very library. And the library had just reopened, for some of you who may remember, um, after a very massive renova renovation. And this new library and programs like Writers at Work were instrumental in the very beginnings of the resurgence of downtown, when nothing was going on downtown. Does anybody remember that? No streetcar, nothing. Well, in the series, Whitney has brought in several writers, um, some more than once, and we are lucky to have one of those writers here tonight in John Freeman. So uh, John Freeman has had a long and enduring career of making sure that new writers, new voices are heard from all over the world. It's almost as if John won't rest in this life until he has made sure that every author, every novelist or poet who has a story to tell gets the chance to tell it. John is an author and a poet who was last year for his book, I think two years ago, called Maps. He is the former editor of Granta and now the founder of Freeman's Anthology of New Writing, which the latest installment just came out in October, and it's called California. And it captures both the myths and reality of the state, as well as its complex history through the eyes of both new writers, not writers who have already passed away, <laughs> and established names as well. So tonight, John will be in conversation with Whitney um, about his new book, Dictionary of the Undoing, which, by the way, is for sale out here, and John will sign books afterwards. Um, it's both an inspiring and, I must say, difficult book to read, and John asks all of us, you, me, um, some very hard questions about the world we're living in today. And he also actually offers some hope and possible suggestions on what we can all do to take action in the world today. Uh, some are very simple. Um, be gentle, be kind. Uh, step away from the screens and um, read a book or write something down. Uh, the very least, go out and live your life with other people, be engaged. And my favorite, go to literary events, go to the library. <laughs> I feel so grateful to have John here in the Kansas City Public Library tonight, but I feel even more grateful that he is here in the world right now, helping bring us all together, find optimism and hope in difficult times through words, language, and each other. So please help me welcome John Freeman and Whitney Terrell. Thank you, that was very nice. You get to go on the far side. We both have our reading glasses now. I think I when know, we, I first we, met you, we didn't have them. When we first met, we didn't shave. <laughs> and the bottles of water were much bigger. They were. <laughs> <laughs> we've, met, we've known each other since, I think, at least 2001, right? Because uh, that was when you re read The Huntsman, and that was when I met you. Yeah, I, w I went to Whitney's September 10th, 2001 event oh, yep. at, at a bar in New York City. Um, in some ways, this book all began there, and certain, you know, like all the bad things that we're dealing with now, I feel like sort of started there. Hmm. Um, all right, so I wanted to start. Um, you begin your prologue by outlining the dangers of our time, autocracy, climate change, lack of privacy, cost of healthcare, all those you know, things that we were just talking about. But you begin with an interesting question, which is, what if the story, as I've been telling it above, this litany of disasters, was wrong? Mm. What do you mean by that? How could it be wrong? We all know that story's right. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, you know, just in advance of this event, I was talking to Andy, and we were 
relating about how, you know, if you give it a day or two, it's going to get 30 degrees warmer here. <laughs> and if you wait another day, it's probably going to be uh, just cold enough to snow. Yeah. And the speed with which that change has entered our life is really alarming and quite terrifying, to be honest, um, because there doesn't seem to be any kind of predictable scale at which it's going to happen. And yet, if you live anywhere near a body of water, for example, you'll go there and you'll see that the tide comes in every morning, and you'll notice that birds come there to fish, and you know that the sun will rise, and then towards the end of the day, the sun will set, and that some predictable things will happen. And that in, it's a kind of microcosm for all the things that we're doing, everyone here, at some capacity, will probably go to work. You know, you'll make a sandwich at lunch, or if you're not a bread person, you'll have, I don't know, salad, yeah. Um, and we'll do things, you know, if you work here, you might hold the door open for someone. On Sundays, you might go to church, and you might volunteer as a deacon, or you might volunteer at a hospital. You, all these things that knit us together will continue. And yet, based on the way we now get information, we see extremely alarming things all the time. Um, partly because we have the access to all the information in the world, and usually information that's in the news is kind of bad. And so we're getting all the world's worst news all the time, like fed down into us through an I, you know, IV drip through the internet, which isn't to say that this, this news is false. It's just simply to say that we have never had this much access to this much information in a time which is already arrestingly out of sorts, at least naturally. And then you add to that the fact that we're in the middle of a norm-smashing, um, um, very erratic administration. But I think what's, what's happened is that in the midst of all this, there's been a, an escalation and inflation of the, the, in language towards overstatement. Mm. Uh, there's been a planing down of complexity of language. And so instead of saying someone is um, cruel or mean-spirited um, or unkind, or not very gentle, you say they're evil. And so what, what word do you use then when someone aerial bombs a hospital on purpose you know, in, in a war zone? Do, uh, on, or what, what do you do when people put children in cages? You know, maybe that's not evil, but it's certainly evil adjacent. Uh, and so one of the things this book is trying to do is to do two things. One is to reclaim you know, some of the... Um, nuances within language because that will allow us to mean what we say and to have a kind of scale for what we say. And the second is to appreciate that within those scales and the variety of language is a network that connects you to me. Mm -hmm. And that network is crucial for us to live within a civil society. That language is the thing which connects us. It allows me, even if I'm not speaking in words, if I'm signing to you, I'm saying to you information, I'm saying I'm talking about feelings. I'm talking about what's happening. And without that language, um, we're alone and we're isolated. And I think the, the, the way that a language has been vandalized and abused in plain sight right now is some, to some degree on purpose. It's meant to divide us. It's meant to make us feel alone. Uh, and well, that relates to, you, you talk about what, what if deforming our ability to imagine the present, this is from that same prologue, mm. um, is precisely what governments and power systems do to control us. And what if I told you we have the power to change this? I mean, that's what I, that, that third question is the important part yeah, of the book. I do think we have know? the power to change that. Um, it's simply, it's right in front of us here in this library, is to go and to open books, to read yeah. the newspaper, to use language carefully and mindfully and meaningfully with each other, to not always use the, the sort of, you know, 30 ought six gauge, you know, piece of word. You know, you, you can sometimes use a BB gun, and sometimes you don't actually have to harm someone, actually, to use language carefully and, and meaningfully. Well, it, I mean, there's a tradition, and I have students here who have studied George Orwell's essay on politics in the English language, and also there's a really good essay by Donald Barthelme called On Not Knowing, that are both talk about the problems of what Barthelme calls adding freshness to a much handled language, but also talk about the way that language can be deformed Language is usually deformed and stripped of meaning for political reasons, which yeah. is what you're talking about here and what you talk about later um, in the book on, on, on 46, where you talk about the abuse of language and the way that contributes to political power. 
Yeah, yeah, I think right now, on top of all the things I described just a moment ago, we're, the, this government in particular um, is using language um, and is trying to, to use language as a weapon. Um, it's using language to, to ostracize people, to create aliens out of people, to, to draw the worst out of us. And it's also using language to make no sense. I mean, I'm sure you've watched these clips. And, you know, it, it is sort of funny, but it's actually not that funny. It's not funny. When, it's very frightening to me. The, the deliberate misuse of language is a political yeah. machine, right, that I think you do a I good job of describing. I agree with you. Actually, no, I don't agree with you. Yeah. And, you know, that is every clip that you'll see of Giuliani speaking. And I think that is, that is, that is sort of my, that is a lawyerly jujitsu because once you see something stated to be true and then instantly disavowed and agreed to be false, and that process is repeated and repeated and repeated, and something which is said emphatically and, and passionately in the morning is then denied or forgotten about or just brushed off in the afternoon, everything starts to make a little nonsense. This abuse of language is a thing that, this is another thing that is really bothering me right now about the way that people are covering the impeachment hearings, which is that I find, I hear commentators saying like, okay, so they, meaning Devin Nunes, or, or people who are trying to defend the president, are gonna argue this next. Mm. And here's what we're gonna say. And then they're gonna say, but then, if, then they'll, they, they keep trying to anticipate arguments that are being made in bad faith that are deliberately illogical arguments. And trying to find logical answers to illogical arguments is this crazy tail chasing game that I feel like people that I think are of good faith are engaging in that is, they will lose at mm -hmm. every time you engage in that game. Yeah, the, I think for a long time the news in the political sphere has focused way too much on strategy. You know, our election is a two-year, you know, strategy chronicle, you know, as if none of it actually mattered. I mean, what, an election is, among uh, many things, it's about what the country is and who lives in it and what its values are, but uh, so infrequently can those actual conversations exist. Like, is it the government's responsibility to take care of people in need? That's a valid question. That's an enormous question. Um, at what point does the government's you know, capacity to take care of vulnerable people end and private business begin? Where, where is that line? Right. Instead, it's sort of, um, oh, you know, they're going to go to court now to contest this part of the ACA law. And Trump, is, Trump has made, an, made another uh, victory in the courts. And, it, and, and instead, it's not, there's never a, a step back that says, well, what does this victory actually mean or what does that loss mean? Right, uh, And so w there's so much fine-grained detail about strategy that it, sometimes it, it completely loses the point that strategy is, n is um, nonsensical, and, and also, deliberately so. And also the loss of language is, as you talk about it, because this section that I'm looking at now comes from your section on hope, the letter H. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you say governments uh, do violence to language. They don't do it because they're linguists. They do it because language is designed socially between us just as hope emerges in a collection of bodies, if you can attack language, you can begin to uncouple the ability for people to mean anything to one another, mm -hmm. and thus shut down the chance for hope to happen. Yeah. Is, where did you come up with that? I mean, how did that thought happen to you? Did you work your way to that? Is it something you all already knew? Was there a process where you arrived at this way of thinking about the way to think about what's happening today has to do specifically with language? Uh, a couple of things. One, you know, the idea that hope exists between bodies. You know, I, I don't know where you were, but when the Rodney King... Um, I was in grad school. I was in high school, and the video came out, and for some reason, my parents, we, we went to a, a, a majority black um, church that day, mm -hmm. and the, the, they sang spirituals, and we sat there. We were one of some of the only white people in the church. I have no idea why my dad brought my family there, but I think I understand why he brought us there which is to say that, you know, this is not tolerable. This is intolerable. Uh, this is a, an, an invalid way to um, make a judgment based on how to treat people, and this violence is not tolerable. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling, you know, discomforting, uh, dis uncomfortable, um, out of place, but also, oddly, people around us seemed to understand while we were there, and it made me slightly hopeful that, it, that given what... Uh, had just existed, what had just been broadcast on the television, 
um, certainly there would be a strong urge to, to kick the fam us out of the church. But in fact, we were welcome in, in the end. And so I felt like throughout every interaction, there is an opportunity for us to bend towards something hopeful mm -hmm. uh, rather than hateful. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I do think that um, the ability to express complexity in language whether it's in a song, whether it's in uh, spirituals, whether it's in poetry, whether it's in a novel. You know, you had to write a 400-page novel to understand why Kansas City was built the way it was. Yeah. You know, it, you couldn't <laughs> do true. that in a, in a poem. Yeah. You know, and you, and you needed, you needed 140,000 words to do it. That is true. And we were talking about this in class the other day that, um, you know, it's one thing to say, like, don't be mean to people. That's a line that doesn't mean anything. It's abstract language. But when you embody it in a novel, right, that shows the cost of violence in some way, that forces the person to live through in a complex way the emotional you know, progress of a person who's learning that lesson, yeah. then you can actually accomplish something mm -hmm. in, in communicating with a reader. But, but, but slogans, which are political kinds of language, yeah. don't do that. You know, they don't oh, convey sort of like, that kind of complexity. Slogans are like a worry bead. You know, you can sit there and finger them in your pocket, but they... Hashtags with the same thing, right? Yeah. They, they sort of resist your... Um, and so part of this book is me meandering towards thoughts. And sometimes they surprise me as I wrote them because I, the way that I wrote this book was... I was, like some of you probably, I was watching about three to four hours of news a night. I was sort of collating all the stuff in my mind. I thought I had a coherent record of what was happening in the country, and then I would wake up, and then the whole thing would start all over again. Right. I thought, this is insane. And I'm not even, you know, I'm not even a political news journalist. Um, so, and I would go to protests, and I would come back, and I would see the difference between how they felt there and how they were reported. And so I just thought, this, this is not a sustainable way to live, to be this agitated all the time. Which and is my, the first word you talk about in the And collection. I thought, you know, my agitation was sort of leading me to some degree to apathy. You know, just the way that information is leading some of us to apathy. You think, okay, 26 people are worth half the wealth of the country. Like, where do you even begin to start to do something about that? You know, it's, it, it just makes you just feel like there's nothing you can possibly do. And so I was, I was frankly pretty depressed. I didn't know, you know, and, I, and the news was making it worse, and the news felt like a, um, it, it felt luxurious in a, in a voluptuous kind of decadent way. Like I was basically making it more possible for me to do something by sort of wrapping myself in the bad news. And so I just thought, all right, I'm gonna watch one hour of TV a night and I'm gonna get up and read That'll some be generally a good rule, John. Well, <laughs> you should have gotten there sooner. I, if I had listened <laughs> to my parents, yeah. But I, I, I got up and I started reading poems, you know, because I just felt like sometimes some kind of, um, kind of spark of beauty and language is enough, at least if you're a word person. That's how I felt for me. I just thought, like, just give me something. Like, and I think poetry right now is such a, a vibrant genre in America, literature, not because it's beating people with slogans, although you see placards at marches with slogans from Audre Lorde and Adrian Rich and other political poets. The reason it, it, it's alive is because it has that unexpected swerve towards tenderness. And that comes through the beauty of language. And so I was reading poems, and then I, I, I started writing. And I, so I, I, I sort of wrote a, a goodbye to all that to Facebook. Because one of the aspects of this was I was churning through all this information and then vomiting it onto Facebook to all my 5,000 closest friends. And then they were like, ah, oh, that's great. I feel that way, too. And then they were forwarding it around. And then we were all eating the same vomit. <laughs> and it felt like a nu nutritious meal. And then I thought, this is really dysfunctional. So I just said, okay, I'm off. Because I just felt like, what if there are some thoughts that have to happen interior, in an interior way instead of a projected way? And the, the, so I said, I wrote a piece on agitation and apathy. And I thought, oh. Huh. The, the, the next thing I thought a lot about in that period, this is about two years ago, was just how much of spectacles that we saw about the body being abused. And I go, this is like it's redefining the body as this kind of container for pain. And that seemed like 
it's frightening because it's kind of the way that this administration thinks of the body. It's like some bodies are built for pain. Some bodies are built to be punished. Some bodies are punishable because of what they are and what they look like and how they have sex or what colors they are or what choices they make. And, you know, we're about to go into a census. And right now it's like, th this, I'm not making this up, but the guy, the, one of the people that was advising how the census was going to run, who died, was going to yeah. basically run the census as a giant gerrymandering experiment, basically to create a permanent Republican. Bob Feller was his name? Yeah, a permanent Republican majority by kicking off minorities. And I think this, this, the abuses of the body and the spectacle of abuses of the body are ways that, that are making it easier to, to come up with an idea of citizenship which is made through subtraction. And to me, that's frightening because that's the, that's the, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that that's the mode, that's like the sort of backdoor towards fascism. They start picking off weak, the vulnerable, the homosexuals, Jewish people, you know, people who are, and, and you can come up with a list really quickly in your head because these are the people that have been historically made vulnerable in moments where an essentializing narrative, rhetoric about nationalism, about what a country is, starts to emerge. Well, the, one of the things they do at the library, I'll point out, is that they have, I always because I always see it on Facebook, sadly, um, but they, they, they swear in, tell me if I'm wrong, like you guys do, uh, you swear in people for citizenship on a regular basis, yeah. right? right? Naturalization, which I think is a really beautiful um, sort of civic ritual that we have in America, and that I like it that the library does that. And I also agree with you, just, I've been noticing what I miss is I don't, I am gonna, I don't have enough loneliness in my life, which is something that I tried to get rid of when I was, you know, for a long time. Like, I got way too much loneliness. Let's get rid of that, you know, let's fill that space up. But actually being lonely was an important part of creating fiction for me, and a lot of good writing got done because I didn't have enough things to do. Do you think it's loneliness or solitude? Solitude is different. Okay, solitude would be better. Because I think you term. can be amidst a crowd and be lonely. That's true. And to me, that's the overwhelming feeling of Facebook. It's like you're connected to all these people. And, then, and like some people... Well, I, I feel lonely. I'm, loneliness I is like, I mean, like not being on Facebook lonely. Like not, yeah. not, not having something to, you know, not having an immediate project. Yeah. Right? Um, where you're taking a walk. I mean, I used to have to fill time. I'm like... Well, let's go for a drive. You know? <laughs> that's that not like the dad. case anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. not everything is fungible. You know, time is not time is not necessarily a resource until you view it as one. You know, not everything has to project be mapped onto um, metaphors of capital exchange. You know, like there are things that, that are not abstractable that that cannot be scaled, and so empathy is not a scalable thing to some degree. You know, I can, I can care about and abstract various people that are in my neighborhood, but it, their lives mean so much more to me when I read the newspaper and someone tells a story about someone in that neighborhood. And this is why, you, you know, you have to have very good writers telling stories because you don't want to pick a representative person, but if you tell a story about someone maybe who's trying to become a citizen and who eventually has a date to come to the, the library here mm -hmm. and do that, you can suddenly appreciate the complexity of a journey of someone you know, like that person in abstract, and it makes empathy more possible. But you cannot, I don't think, scale empathy from that person to 10,000 to 100,000. And so for me, I, one of the reasons why I start to push back against social media is because it's treating us like, you know, like we wanna all shop for some of the values like friendship and intimacy um, and collectiveness and community at, at, at like a, a, a big box chain store, like where the more of it you can get, the better. It's like, oh, you know what? I, want, I don't want 100 friends. I want 4,000. <laughs> you know why? What, what, you know. That's they, what you mean by scalable. You mean like you can't have, you can't have empathy for 5,000 people if you have 5,000 friends. I don't think you can right? have, I, I honestly, I mean, unless you are, do not sleep, you cannot have 5,000 friends. Yeah. Well, you can have 5,000 acquaintances who have digital pictures that are inside your computer and who you, whose, whose, whose dogs you might recognize if shown <laughs> rapidly in a strobe-like fashion. But I, I, 
I think this, these tools are, are part, I think, of what's making our descent into this, I would say, qu quite infernal moment possible because we're distracted. We're not in the public space. We're not looking at people. We're having debates on Facebook where we're like shouting at people that we disagree with, partly because their face is not in front of us. And even though I'm saying some of these things about Trump, like if someone were to disagree with me, I wouldn't say, ah, oh, you, you know, exclamation point, insert swear word, insert swear word, you're a total fraud. You know, that, that, but that's, that's how rapidly things, be, you know, accelerate on, on social media. I had this thought, which I, it was a new thought that I had while I was reading your book, which is that people who are the most successful on social media display most of the traits that you're criticizing, right? They're autocratic. They want everyone to listen to them. They want everyone to take up their, 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 their grievances. They want people to go attack the people who they have grievances against. They retweet someone who said something bad about them and they want all their followers to go get all over that person, right? Yeah. That, all that's, that kind of bad behavior is autocratic behavior on the left and the right. It's, yeah. it's not politically restricted, right? Yeah, no, People I, I, are being mini autocrats. They're mini kings and queens on, on the social media platforms. We, the response, I you think. And I could all name like 10 of them. Yeah, and, and this is partly why I, I took a step back from it and took a lap in the real world. Because I was, <laughs> on, on, one of my friends who is not on social media at all, who's a novelist, came through and I was having one of those days where I just was shaking my head at some of the behavior you described. Because I don't think the response to the t kinds of categories and the t t kinds of policies and the kind of reductions based on you know, categories that, that this administration is, is purporting is to then in turn celebrate categories and to make ourselves more, um, more pure either than the right or than each other um, to create hierarchies of categories within each other mm -hmm. and to, to sort of retreat into other forms of tribalism and I said this to my, I, and my friend just said, you know, people are just so much nicer in the real world. He said, you should spend more time there. <laughs> and I, it was in the middle of writing this book, and I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's read, let's read this part about agitation, since we're talking about agitation, and, mm -hmm. and we'll see how that goes. Can you just read from there to like the end of the section? Would that be okay? Yeah. Like from here? Yeah. We live in agitating times. How else to describe what it feels like to be alive today? as if a rough, rough rope has been raked over tender skin, waking it painfully. The parts of us that feel are raw now, and they're alert all the time. For a good reason. Dark forces are afoot. You feel them like the kick of a boot, a beam of a light shone from a hand that holds power, a truck driving by slowly, knowing you ought to be scared. These types of gestures were once done in the dark, or at least the half-light of shadows. Now there's, there's a strong sense their perpetrators don't have to hide. Maybe they never did. That feeling, that rush of adrenaline and alarm that bolts through the body in such moments is fear, the body telling us something isn't right, an animal sense that never leaves no matter how much we sit at a desk using our civilized skills. What civilization, though? For those of us who are protected by our skin color, one of the peculiar aspects of living today is, is we can watch the fear of others slowly dousing ourselves with a sick kind of relief that at least it's not us. And thus the system tests us. How much are you willing to watch? How much are you willing to sacrifice to help another in need? How long will you observe the complacency of the safe without damning them too? The system is testing us and it's pushing us because it's being pushed to the limit. Global capital and democracy depend on interconnectedness, and yet the checks and balances of these systems have been ripped off or proven to be useless, leaving many governments wide open to corruption and manipulation, to profiteering and power grabbing. Banking regulations that were placed to prevent, that are put in place to prevent another collapse are all but gutted in many economies across the world. Voting rights are under attack everywhere. Environmental accords to share the burden of the disaster we're approaching have all but failed, bless you. Many governments, you're welcome, uh, see a distracted, apathetic populace and are grabbing more power for themselves than ever before. Even if you don't intend, um, 
Even if you don't intend to read the headlines, they're hard to ignore. Every day a new crisis, an item of news is channeled and elevated, then broadcast and discussed, then riffed on. We have 86,400 seconds a day, but we typically spend many of them looking at a handful of images, reading about a half a dozen stories, enthralled to just a few personalities, or maybe just one. We have all the choice in the world, yet time and again, the little invisible directors and the codes that run the world draw us to a simple few. Why? It suits the corporations and the governments that hold power for us to feel this way. Agitated users of social networks click more, we know, and click for the media giants of the world mean huge profits. There's a reason you can't look away, too. It's not just that the spectacles our new forms of media are showing us are that entertaining. Some of them are grisly, some are strange. Some are downright weird and grisly all at the same time, like Pizza Rat. But they've been designed for you. Every time you use social media and the internet, data is collected on how you move in virtual space and what moves you there, and then ways are found to keep you connected. The world's most powerful artificial intelligence is being used on you. And for the price of free admission, all of us who use these tools allow it to happen. It feels good to have a say, which is what our new, tech, new media makes us feel like. To have a voice, even if it's just one among many. To have a platform, to be followed, to be liked, to be looked at and paid attention to, even in a negative way. Yet bit by bit, as the, as the number of social media users tops one-third of the planet, we are actually use, losing purchase on what it means to have a voice. If you speak only to those who agree with you, what does that mean? If you're constantly being agitated by spectacles of abuse and suffering and destruction, at what point does outrage inflation run away with the essential value of language? How do you express abomination over murder and destruction when all that language has been hollowed out by a small-time thievery or just idiocy. The governments that run the world and the technology companies that help us watch them and one another have an insidious convergence of strategy, perhaps unplanned, but reinforcing nonetheless. Both benefit when we are frightened and enraged, agitated, abraded. Agitated people feel more powerful because they're at least alive to something when in fact, they're being more easily manipulated. That's the point I wanted you to get to. Thank you, if you give me a hand. <laughs> that thought that my agitation is actually me being manipulated was a new thought. I thought, oh yes, you're right, but I hadn't considered that. I wonder if you could like unpack that a little bit or you know, like, what do we do then, you know? Well, I mean, this president is a, uh, He's a genius in distraction, but one of his distraction, distraction tools is to agitate people so that they produce the cloud of smoke that, that gives him cover to do something else policy-wise, which if they were paying attention to, would be incredibly um, uh, uh, resisted. Right. And what's hard about it is that a lot of the things that he's doing to, add, to create these distractionary tools of agitation are deeply, intensely offensive. You know, putting children in cages is actually an agitation tool for other things that this government is doing, although it happens to be part and parcel to their policies. Um, many of the things that Trump says which are racist and offensive are ways to distract from, you know, uh, other policies that he has which are actually enacting racism, which is not to say that a racist comment is not enacting racism, but structural racist policies which are, you know, which are going to be with us for you know, two, three years, or if you count the judges that this president is appointing, possibly decades, um, uh, are, are perhaps where the, the energy should go. But it's really hard not to say, stand up and say, you know, just like when someone says something in a, in a public forum or maybe at dinner with your family, and you're like, whoa, you, can't, you don't say that. That's hurtful to people. And you don't just drive by and say things like that. And yet when a million or two million or three million or five million or 10 million or same million people are saying this, and then it becomes part of talking pieces in the news, and it takes up time in the news when 
perhaps say like there's a new um, environmental bill that's it's quietly being passed, which suddenly makes it easier to drill for oil in indigenous lands, you know, in a different part of the country, which is being handed off to maybe a donor to the president, for example. You, you know, it, it's, it, it feels like you need so a what kind do, of I, I agree with that. Like, I think that's true. I was trying to think about how to deal with it, that particular strategy. One would be uh, in the case of, like, various arguments, right? You just ignore them. You just, you know, you, you can ignore certain things, I mean, right? Trump, don't try to respond to every dumb, you know, argument. In yeah, some, don't, in some you ways. know, I, I really, really wish that the media would stop reporting on Trump's tweets. You know, I, I, honestly, I think it was useful for them to report on the fact that he was trying to intimidate a witness during her testimony, because that is illegal. Um, that is just a classic case of witness tampering. But on the other hand, I think, you know, follow what the policies, you know, follow the record of the judges which are, who are being up for you know, lifetime appointments in the court. Um, you know, follow, follow the money. And, and I, I honestly, I, do you know this, this writer, Nami Kwame Brema, who wrote Fr Friday, uh, Friday Black? I know the book. Yeah. I haven't read it yet. It was a debut short story collection. And I met him through a friend in Syracuse. And he, was, he came to a party with a friend of his who had been working and volunteering in Black Lives Matter for two and a half years. And he was t he, what he was talking about was, um, in, in this, at, at this dinner, was just how exhausted he was mm -hmm. and how some people that he, were working in his, in, in his organization were practically suicidal because of the just relentless amount of information that they had to fight back. Right. The spectacles that they had to <laughs> constantly deal with. The, the just almost overwhelming um, policy problems that they were dealing with. And part of it was that the, the people in the organization felt like, well, if I step away, you know, nothing's going to get done. And I think one of the things that's really destructive about this present moment is how much uh, the administration and, and the powers that be are trying to tell us, trying to separate us, trying to put us into groups. And so when we pre-separate ourselves, we help them. Because that means that no, there's no one that can come up and sort of tap in and say, like, you know what, sit this one out. You, right. look, you, look, you look exhausted. You don't, have, you don't have to go to every single march. You don't have to go to every single sit-in. You don't have to go to every single call-in. Like, maybe you have to go home and be with your family and cook dinner and sit out for, like, a week or two weeks or whatever. And I think this, the, the destruction of language is part of a holistic process of trying to attack the collective to try to attack the notion of a we, mm. you know, and, and without language, there is no we. And yes, there were problems with the we that was often being used. You know, do you ever look at Teju Cole's Twitter yeah. handle? It's like, we who? <laughs> you know, and sometimes there was a we that was being used that would like make other people invisible. It was like, this is the we. And then all people who weren't included in that we were like, well, wait a second, I'm, I'm not included in this. But we can't go the other direction, which is a we is impossible, because that it really helps the incendiary, awful policies mm. that this administration is pushing. Because, so if I can't be part of a we with people of color, if I can't be part of a we you know, respectfully, so that I'm not like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm the white savior. You know, <laughs> that's, that's a really problematic role, but if I can't join in, if I can't be part of a march with people of color, if I can't be part of um, you know, policy arguments where indigenous people, you know, you have to have what it, you know, these groups that are not all the same. Because otherwise, the, the, the divide and conquer policy is really, really, really effective. I get that. I, I guess I feel, I wonder, I mean, obviously I've written about this a lot in Kansas City, but you know, it so, seems so odd to me because I live in a neighborhood that is multiracial, seems very normal, always have in the years that I've lived in the city. And like UMKC is 40% students of color, you know? Um, and so being around 
the school is very diverse space, and it feels like that's our we. That's the we that I'm living in all the time, right? And so I'm trying to figure out why. Is it space? Is it you know? I mean, is it the people in suburbs who never see a, a world like that, or I just you know? I guess that's what that's the the resistant group, you know that. You've dedicated your life to facilitating encounters between people, between people and each other, between people and educators, between people and books. Yeah. And from what, one of the things I've, I've, I've admired about you from the very moment I met you was that you come from a background that could be out in the suburbs. Yeah, you could You could be wearing... It's boring like, out there. It sucks. Oh, you could be wearing seersucker <laughs> pants right now, you know? Having like a little tall glass, you know, and and you could. You, I saw that. That was a soul killer. That was like. I know that was a long that would have been my death. And you know, I, 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 I think that, that that's a scary world to be honest. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I will. And and so I think that the, like maybe the, the the we that needs restoring isn't the we that you live in. Mm -hmm. But it's it's other. There are other parts that you have access to where that we is being attacked. Mm -hmm. For example, like the, you know, public funding of institutions like libraries and schools is under constant assault. And you cannot tell me that given the types of people that use those institutions, that there's not a, like a, a structural form of racism being enacted upon public institutions. Because you cannot look at the way that those funds are withdrawn from public sources that, that are used public resources that are used by a multiracial, multiethnic, um, diverse group of people, all ages, all, all, all backgrounds. And where does it go? It, goes, it often goes to tax breaks that benefit. The people who get hurt the most by this, and, and I think about this often uh, in reference to the novel Stoner, which is a great novel that was set at the University of Missouri about a poor white farmer who remakes his life by coming to be a professor of English at the University of Missouri uh, during the Great Depression. And um, the people who are hurt by funding cuts in higher education are, yes, people who live in the urban environment, but also whites who are living in the countryside who do not have, no longer have access to that way of uh, moving up in the world, which was what Stoner the novel is about, right? That the mm. university, the, the, the stoner's father knows that it's gonna be tragic for him, for his son to go to college because his son will never come back to the farm and it's really hard for him to let him go. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he makes him go because he knows it will give him a better life. And that concept of education, which was a bipartisan view, now has been sacrificed to this idea of we don't have a we. We don't want to fund the other. Yeah, right? Why, that kind why of help thing. someone that you will never meet? Yeah. When you can actually, you know, I, I think we've all been sold. And, you know, some of my ranting, and I know it's ranting. <laughs> I'm just, I'll, I'll admit it. Like, some of my ranting. Hey, we did pass a tariff. We, did, we passed a tax for the library, though, right? That was a good thing recently. Yeah. We can all give ourselves a round of applause but for I, that. But I, I think some of, the, 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 some of my ranting about social media is that it's a, it's a form, it's become a, a highly, a, highly normalized form of acceptable narcissism. OK, that's good. Now, that brings me to a question I had. So in your, by the way, you guys understand, like every, there's, there's like 26 you know, words that he talks about that are each one of them a letter of the alphabet. I'd forgotten how many letters there were in the alphabet, perhaps because I spent too much time on social media. But I looked it up. I was like, all right, 26. <laughs> I tried to count them up. I got lost. I don't know. So you should know that. I'm sad that I didn't know that. But in the F section, dedicated to the word fair, better than other words I could have thought of that you could have done in the F section. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you write, it is better if change comes from a joint effort between so-called beneficiaries and losers of political change. Mm -hmm. How can that be true? The way that I understand politics is like you win, you help your buddies, and everybody else who doesn't win, they, they must be destroyed or, you know, this is a, this is a zero sum game, right? And that's true. We, the Democrats, we're going to win and we are going to screw the Republicans as hard as possible I don't if think we can. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's a. That, but you're the, positing a different concept here that I think is important. Yeah, because otherwise power is always usurping. You know, basically you amass enough power to knock the people in power out of power. And then you do to them the things that you thought, you know, oh, I've been waiting to do this the whole time, you know. And, 
you know, the, to me, a rich and healthy polity is one that actually doesn't work on that function, that actually reestablishes re some values of fairness. Because fair is really, is far, to me, more, more uh, sustainable and far um, uh, enriching to, and is safer, to be honest, um, than the, the kind of Lord of the Flies version of politics that you just described. Because eventually, you know, um, and I don't, I, honestly, I think so much of what we're living through is a kind of white lash to, to Obama's eight years in power. Yeah. And our country demographically is changing, and I think there is a p small but engaged, politically powerful section of the country to whom this idea of a, of a country which is no longer a white majority is terrifying. And the only way that they can deal with it is to subtract, is to like basically subtract from the citizenry, is to disenfranchise voters. And this is exactly what's happening. Um, and that's not fair. Uh, so if the, if the Democrats get elected, yeah, like maybe they should gerrymander every district within an inch of its life and make sure that Republicans can never get elected. But I think um, ultimately it, the, a, a much better model would be to actually try to create uh, an example of fairness. And I think fairness actually draws people to it, and it, it creates a bigger space, whereas um, the, the version of power that you described sends people underground and makes them go, go buy guns. The natural alliance, of course, of, you know, like that, that Baldwin always talked about being the one thing that, that would be the last thing that America would try would be aligning working class whites with working class people of color, and then you would have a tremendous coalition. And that, that's the thing that I always look forward to and hope like someday would get figured out. You know? That's the we that I would like to see happen. That, and you know, of course, there are reasons why that didn't happen. Unions were very racist early on and didn't do a good job. But they don't have to be that way now. They could, no. you know, anyway. Well, too many elections are run on fear, you know, and racialized versions of fear often you know, the Willie Horton ads, and, and Trump with his, you know, Mexicans with their giant calves jumping over the border. And it's, it's a really sad and tedious and tediously effective tool. And I just, part of me, one of the part of, parts of me that I don't, I cannot necessarily lift from despair is just the seeming endlessness of the capacity to regenerate um, uh, susceptible voters to such uh, language, you know? Um, and and I, this is what, to me, this is why the word for T is, is teachers. And, you know, and I, honestly, I think there are some very educated um, xenophobes everywhere. <laughs> you know, the, the Nazis had a rich and well-articulated culture across music and philosophy and the Weimar state just sort of absorbed everything and warped it towards you know, what, what the Third Reich was, was doing. Um, but I, I think with, uh, with, with education, you ha you, with a truly en enlarging idea of education, uh, you can create, I think, the kinds of spaces for undestination-driven thought, which is what we do not have. You know, the possibility to be wrong the possibility to explore, the possibility not to flame and blame someone, but to actually explore something in an essay. And also to have encounters like you can with a book with a, other people. Um, and if a public education, like the one that I had growing up, like I played basketball growing up, and you know, I, by, by going into the gym, I was in an integrated space. You know? And I think uh, uh, the, the more that we are, and that's not necessarily always, always the case, but the more that we pull resources out of public education, the more that we create and reinforce divisions within the education which this already exist. This argument for unity and diversity, which is a Ralph Ellison's term, you know, is also an argument that Ellison took a lot of crap for, you know, and was criticized as being an Uncle Tom and, and too like nice to the structures of uh, power in white society. So, you know, it's gonna be hard. There are always people on the left and the right who don't want to believe in that idea of unity and diversity. And I believe in it, 
you know, I think it's important. But I just want to point out that if you, even if you look at the, 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 the existence of that idea historically, when the argument was made by somebody as great as Ralph Ellison, you know, even he, you know, had to take a lot of heat for, you know, making that kind of argument. I mean, one of the things I love about Ellison is he gave birth to Toni Morrison. You know, in Toni Morrison's novels, um, a lot of them are, you know, I just taught uh, Tar Baby, mm -hmm. you know, and the, uh, uh, most of the characters in that book are, are, are black, African-American, and Toni Morrison's novels were not explaining her characters. They were not like, they were not looking, they're not saying like, let us explain our blackness to you. They yeah. were just black characters living their lives. Right. And I think one of the things we can do by believing in unity and believing in diversity is respect the fact that not everything has to point in a direction. No one has to verify themselves to a so-called normal if you believe in true unity. Yeah. And so, you know, for growing up, looking like me and living where I did, I could assume my life and my ideas were always legible because I was always seeing versions of myself projected outwards in culture, in politics, in power. And I think what's changing in the United States is, is how <laughs> desperately we need to acknowledge um, how, how those representational optics are, well, are harmful, and also how if you believe in unity and, and diversity and equality, like basically you can, you can create a world where uh, people like me don't find it traumatic <laughs> to enter a book and not see anybody like me. Yeah. You know? It's not the worst thing in the world. And, and I think that's, that's a long way. We're a very, very long ways off. And if you look at who's resisting, <laughs> And it's really hard not to make judgments, but if you look at the, the group, you know, when they get together who are resisting this impeachment inquiry, they all look, they all look kind of the same. They all have the same parts. <laughs> you know, they all have the same pronoun. Um, it, they don't look like America. And that's, that's frightening. That, to me, that's frightening. You know, that the thing that's standing between us and a possible... Um, and possible justice is a group of people who don't who don't want the country who want the country to look like them, and who don't want to acknowledge people who don't look like them. I want you to. We're going to open up for questions, and I'm going to have John read a short piece, and you guys can be thinking of your questions, so we don't have to do the awkward silence part of the questioning. Um, and I'm going to have him read from the end of the book, just like this part on you and I drew a line where. Probably be good to stop. Okay. That seemed good. And then we're going to let you buy his book, which is why people go on book tour <laughs> and how writers stay in business. We do not actually go to places and just I, speak I just... for free and hope nobody buys the book. We actually are trying to sell the book to the people who come. I, I actually endorse iced tea. No. <laughs> I mean, I, it would be great, though, if, if we all had like some sort of... A sponsor, like a we were sponsor. NASCAR, we had a bunch yeah. of patches I just, on. I just want to thank... You know, like Starbucks. When I'm writing, I drink Kirkland <laughs> purified water. <laughs> Always goes down. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> She's reading you. from you. Yeah. There is no clanging ambulance on the way. No sled pulled through the avalanche. No helicopter rescue. No phone call in the night to say, now is the time. We have watched and we have watched and we have watched a rising tyranny take hold in so many parts of this globe. We stood by as organizations that secured the eight hour workday and the right not to eat rotten meat were blithely destroyed. As presidents swept the chips into their pile before our eyes, we bargained away our health care, our schools, our digits said thumbs up to no privacy. All the terrible things were over there. Well, now it's night's close, and we the people have very little. In some places we can speak, in others not. In some places we can vote, in others not. Some places our bodies are illegal, in others not. But in too many places all of us are barely getting by while a criminal amount of wealth and power is held by a very few. 
And in far too many places, we feel far too close to a rollback of modernity. You are the only way out. Only you can do something. They might get their act together, but chances are they won't. Who gives up power anyway? Usually it's someone who has to forfeit power. He might do it for you, but he cannot be counted on. She, perhaps. Women, in fact, do far too much. They know this. They have learned one of the key things to know is how to say no. So as you read this, the network of responsibility that you feel held by, supported in, has probably become threadbare. And now it's your turn to weave a little decency back into it. You don't have to stand before a House of Parliament and read a poem or attend a vigil at a politician's office or shout a question in a public hearing or write letters to the heads of global companies. You can start with just one thing, one act of optimism, one day a week, maybe just a gesture, maybe opening a door for someone else. Life is, in fact, a blizzard of such gestures. People are kinder in the real world, too, they are, than they are in line. So live, if you can, a little more there. Throw your first gesture at making the real world a little better, a little kinder, a richer, less toxic environment. It's like drinking tap water rather than bottled water once a day. What if more of us made the same choice? Would we have islands of trash in our oceans the size of small countries? That's an accumulation of terrible gestures. A disposable cult culture says, it's your problem here. You take care of it. But that's not a fair way to live. To embrace a world of trash is to say that some of us are essentially trash. All of us know what sort of imbalances this blizzard of gestures has brought today. A world where 26 people own more than half the world. It can be undone by you, though. Begin with small gestures. That's how hope starts. It's a match in the dark, not a bonfire. Strike it. <coughs> Give someone a coin. Listen to a friend longer than you want to. Walk an extra block home to mail a postcard from your local post office rather than send an email. Bike to the farmer's market to buy your produce from a farmer. Read the newspaper and write back to your columnist on a piece of paper. Write a letter of thanks to your, school, your child's teacher. Encourage people to save up some time to take a few hours off work to vote, to vote early. Watch one last TV show and dedicate one third of that time to attending, say, a political rally. March for things you want to happen. Spend a weekend walking door to door to talk to people you want to come with you. Introduce yourself to them. Listen to them tell you what they care about and why. March with women. Thank you. You want to go ahead. So restricting the question simply to the monitoring of news events, how do we gauge or how do we pick and choose and decide how much time we're going to spend every day on absorbing news? I'm assuming that we know what real news sources are as yeah. opposed to social networking or fake news. Yeah. How do we properly assess the, the correct amount of time that we spend on monitoring news? I, I, I wish I had a... I, that's a, that's a, the right way to ask a question, by the way. That was a question and not a statement, which we highly approve of. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, thank you for that question, because it's, it's sort of the $10 million question, you know, is how much information is enough? How much is too much? And I think for every person, it's different. And every, uh, for every person, it's also different in different time periods. Because what, part of what this book is trying to um, write into is to try to encourage myself, and, uh, and in the course of doing that, encourage others maybe to find public spaces within their community in which they can enact decency and can uh, find a way to maybe be involved in things that maybe enact social change in ways that are tangible. And so it's a lot easier to do that locally than to sort of pitch yourself at the national level. And I think one thing that we're living through right now is just news as entertainment, news that's 24 hours a day, news that's blasting at us, that's creating a kind of reality show of news. 
and about which we cannot really often have that much import, but if we start locally, I think we have more time. And to some degree, you don't have to watch hours and hours of news to do that. Like, so if there's a, if there's a local hearing on a bond um, that's being floated, in which you can go and participate and speak back to your local councilmen and councilwomen and council people, that's, you know, you should probably maybe list, read 30 minutes or an hour less news that day and go to that meeting where you can actually have your voice heard because, you know, in, in, in certain places, um, Oakland, for example, was, was one of them. Oakland was, uh, in the 90s, was up for having an ICE detainment center. And people, the residents of Oakland, of the neighborhood where this ICE detainment center would be, came to that hearing en masse and said, no, no, we're not going to have this in our neighborhood. This is, and you know, maybe that's shifting things down the road, but as a result of doing that, they didn't have that in their neighborhood. And I think if all of us were more engaged locally, which doesn't require as much news, um, we could be in the spaces where we're not just ab passively absorbing news, but in, in part of the act of being a citizen is kind of creating the news, is creating possibility. So oh. th that's uh, it's a kind of roundabout answer, but it, so it, it really is, to me, much more functional to go locally and, and do things. I would also say that reading fiction is an active thing rather than listening to news, which is a, a passive thing. I, th the podcast that I do that John's been on was about, th my feeling was that everything that we were dealing with in the news had already been handled in literature and in fiction. And so we try to talk about the news, but through books that books and literature that have dealt with the issues that we're kind of facing today, there's a little bit of a deeper way to think about it. You know, and I think that that's a more active way to look back at what's been written to help us think about what's happening now. And I think you can probably know when you're watching the news and there's a, there's a discussion, it's like, okay, here they're going to speculate for an hour about the outcome of something that's going to happen tomorrow. You know, and so, <laughs> so you're waiting during this discussion right. to have your, your, your mindset reaffirmed. You're like, yeah, yeah, that, that, that person's right. Ah, oh, that's, that's awesome. I'm going to add them on Twitter. I'm going to follow them. That's great. So I think there's a lot of news which is actually not news. You know, it's, it's basically churn, it's discussion, it's speculation. Um, and, it, and really, that kind of stuff, really, it, it, it's, it's a form of entertainment as agitation. OK. I'm going to ask her in the back there with the uh, orange sweater on. Well, so I use social media for the library, so part of this, you know, it just really resonated with me, and I'm looking forward to reading your book cover to cover. But I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about your decision to make it a dictionary? And is there some part of it that you think that it needs to be used as a reference then, or if you could just talk about that decision? I'm just going to say we're at 735, and I like to end exactly at 730. We've gone slightly long. It will be short question period. Don't be afraid. Okay? I always get afraid when the questions start. All right. But that is a good question. Yeah. I mean, I, I, part, I, part of the reason I wanted it to be a dictionary is it feels like a, um, something that um, is ironically subjective to some degree. A, a dictionary, you think, is authoritative. But like when Samuel Johnson put together an English dictionary, this was his dictionary. And now there are competing dictionaries, but there aren't that many. But I think we actually ought to have more dictionaries. And one of the things I give to my students, and I think is actually a very good lesson plan, is to make them make their own dictionaries. Because they choose different words. And they have different ways of defining the words. And it, that doesn't create a kind of relative space where everything means something slightly different. I think we need those kinds of um, uh, documents, because then we can actually participate in a conversation where you know, your version of what a citizen is bumps up against my version. And, I, and to me, you know, sometimes a story, a narrative, is a, is a form of a definition. You know, in your name, there's a kind of definition. I am John, named after my mother's brother, John, who changed his name to Stephen Gates because he moved to LA and worked in film. But that's a different story for a whole other book. And so I think you know, we, we, we all are kind of walking um, more complex definitions. And so to me, this book is a kind of reminder that the 
definitions can be far greater than apple, a delicious fruit that occasionally falls from the tree when it's ripe, you know. But it could be like apple, you know, the, 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 the most beloved um, child of a person's, you know, of a, of a person's life. You know, you are my apple. You're sweeter than fruit. You know, and what if definitions were that idiosyncratic? I mean, you could never buy anything at Whole Foods, but th that wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do one more, and then we're going to... Uh, real quick, um, if one of the things that concerns me is emergencies as opposed to day-to-day -day life. We seem to have a problem with that. In other words, something happens and it's normal. I'll use the example of, say, a riot getting out of control in the National Guard and everything has to be brought in. Okay, that may be necessary right now. I com it's a great question. I, I'm, I, think I would say all... nothing is an emergency right now. And if people are telling you it's an, it, I mean, the government's saying like, we have to do this because it's an emergency. Like we have to put troops down at the border to protect people from the, whor the caravan. Yeah. That's not an emergency. Just not. Yeah. You know, I, I, that's, that's what I think. I think, you, I think you know too, at least I know, I began to know, even the, the, the news sources, which are slightly biased in, you know, I'm obviously left wing. There's no hiding that. But I, I would listen to news sources and I'm like, okay, this is, it's not an emergency. Like tonight is not one of those nights where, you know, I, I need to stay up all night and call my, my family and, and maybe make some plans. You know, it, it, it actually, so I, I think one of the things we can do is, is to notice when we're being spoken to as if everything is an emergency. And to, to, to pull back from those things. Because, you know, if we had friends, any of our friends, who were like, oh my God, Whitney's doing this event tonight, and you have to be there because if it's, if it's not, the, the library will close. You know, Whitney might be able to get away with that for one event, but like <laughs> two events down the road, the poor soul that is like the, that next person would have no one there because they would have used up everyone's sympathies. And, and we've, we've been doing this for years and years and years, you know, and so large-scale kind of slow-motion emergencies like what's happening to our climate, where things have to be done now, right now, because if we don't do certain policy things, if we don't start using less fossil fuel and eating less meat, you know, we could end up with a situation where we cannot actually live on the planet in, in 80 to 100 years. Maybe, that's not, maybe that doesn't seem like an emergency, but to me, for the the human civilization to use up the planet for the rest of time, at least for several tens of thousands of years possibly, that to me sounds is, is more of an emergency I can relate to. And if we maybe were not watching the kind of news sources that were always saying like, tonight, you know, it's coming up next, we're gonna, we have a lot of show to come, you know. If we weren't watching those things all the time, maybe we could focus on, yeah, we could, we could focus on the thing, the emergency that is the most meaningful to us. Like maybe for you it's one thing and maybe for someone else it's something else. But if all of us were engaged on a level that respected the emergency that we cared about, you know, for some people maybe it, it, it is police shooting unarmed civilians in cities. Like, yeah, and maybe for other people it is, it is climate change. Maybe for other people it's something else. But that to me, we can, if you pull back from the all emergency all the time, I think you'll be able to, sit, to figure out what, what is the most important emergency to you. All right, I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer everybody's questions, but John will sit out there and come up, and you will come up and ask your question to him directly. Thank you for being here. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Whitney.